This is the second LCB deliberative dialogue uh, session on cannabis plant chemistry. I'd like to welcome our returning panelists today and all of the members of the public who have joined us for this session. My name is Kathy Hoffman and I'm the policy and rules manager for the LCB. And joining me today from LCB and assisting are Audrey Basic and Jeff Kildall, our policy and rules coordinators. Uh, Kendra Hodgson from our marijuana examiners unit will be joining us shortly. Uh, Nick Pullman, our agency chemist and our administrative professional, Tierney Hamilton. I'd like to get us situated today and ready to begin this forum, forum, excuse me. And as a reminder, this is a public work session and I wanna make sure that everyone understands that there is a recording of this session and the chat function, both recording and the chat function, excuse me, um, are public record. So we ask that you're mindful about what you share and what you put in the chat box. Materials for this meeting were distributed via Gov Delivery on July 9th with an updated message on July 12th. These materials will also be available on the LCB Law Rules and Statement website at www.lcb.wa.gov forward slash law and rules a little later this week. Our messaging also provided a way to propose questions in advance. And I'm really happy to share that we did receive some questions before close of business last night. And I'll speak to those in a minute. So consistent with previous deliberative dialogue sessions, we currently have an hour set aside on the agenda for attendees to pose questions to our panel. We'll address questions uh, that were received in advance first. Um, and so, if you wish to pose a question during the session or after uh, the panel has an opportunity to speak, please use the chat box to offer your questions. Staff will monitor the chat box and will raise questions to the panel in the order received. If you have questions for LCB staff or LCB in general, please feel free to contact us after the session today. So before we move into situating ourselves for this dialogue, I'd like to speak more broadly to this process. One of the basic ground rules for participation in deliberative dialogue is that all dialogue um, participants speak for themselves and not as representatives of others' interests. So we seek to and want to provide an unrestricted flow of information without any bottlenecks to inform everyone. Allowing for this makes the process useful for us all. We selected today's panelists based on their expertise in plant cannabis plant chemistry from various perspectives. And we developed our follow-up panel questions with our panelists um, to continue what we hope will be a meaningful dialogue used to inform the pathway forward. It's important to us that this is a collaborative and transparent process. And while we do need to be mindful of the agenda, we hope that today's deliberative dialogue session will encourage everyone to freely listen, think, and explore new ideas together. So a couple of things before we move into the next part of the discussion. As a reminder, this forum is designed to be a neutral space for all to respectfully uh, and safely participate. We ask that you don't use the chat box for anything that could be construed as bullying or harassing. During previous deliberative dialogue sessions we've hosted, that occurred. And if it occurs today, we will close the chat box to all participants. And you may raise your hand if you wish to ask a question. Um, if you have any technical difficulties, please reach out to Audrey, Jeff, and Tierney if you need assistance during the session. I also want to draw your attention to the mute and unmute buttons. Panelists and others, please remember to keep yourself on mute when not speaking. And when you do wish to speak, please make sure you are unmuted. Please note the video icon, and we ask the extent possible, panel members use the video icon for the duration of the session. For other participants, we ask that you keep your cameras off until you've been called upon to speak. So I just wanna run through the agenda really quickly here. Um, and we're in this section here, the, the opening ceremonies, if you will. Um, 
once we go through a few of the slides that sort of introduce the deliberative dialogue model, we'll move into panel introductions. Um, and we'll have introductions of folks who are here. We're going to do that through the chat box function. And then we'll begin our moderated panel discussion at 135 or earlier, hopefully. Um, we'd like to take a break at 12, 2.35 if possible, and then at 2.45 we'll resume um, and begin uh, moderated question and panel response, and that will include some of the um, questions that we received um, last night. So I am going to um, switch screens here. Give me a moment. All right, can everyone see the screen? Okay. Let me see if I can make this full. Sorry, that's not working. Can everyone see okay? Yes. All right. Um, so, going over our you know, overall meeting goals today, we want to continue to build an understanding of cannabis plant chemistry and perspectives. And our intentions today are to provide a continued platform for our panelists to share and discuss cannabis plant chemistry perspective, increase an opportunity for genuine, respectful, moderated dialogue between all participants, and um, begin and continue dialogue that can be used to inform evaluation of THC compound rule and policy development. So why are we here? Um, talked about this in our first dialogue, but we did issue a policy statement in April of this year. Um, we began rule development by way of inquiry on May 12th and expanded the scope of that inquiry on July 7th as well. We'd like to continue discussion concerning cannabis plant chemistry to continue to inform that rule development. Um, after our first deliberative dialogue on this topic, we found that there was a lot of um, follow-up questions that we as an agency had and we heard from others. And so we were thinking about this deliberative dialogue well before uh, we expanded the scope of our original CR 101 in this matter. So, how will data be collected, shared, and presented to decision makers? Um, comments received will be added to an Excel workbook organized by theme and analyzed. That's in the process of happening right now. Um, comments will be presented to the board for review and discussion, and we will share the recordings and comment tables externally. Recordings of these sessions are available pretty much the day after we have a deliberative dialogue session. So we're hoping to get that up on our website in, in the next day or two. All right, so participant roles. Um, our panelists are here today. Their role is to first engage in discussion amongst themselves with questions that we pose to them. My role as the moderator is to facilitate that conversation and maybe ask some follow-up uh, questions. Nick Pullman will be helping me with that. Um, and then our audience, our participants, our listeners, not everyone has to ask a question. It's entirely up to you if you want to participate. Um, but feel free to raise your hand during the open, open question section. Um, I want to touch really briefly on what deliberative dialogue is. For some of you who've been with us before, uh, understand this is probably uh, something you've heard before, but for others who haven't, or who wish to, uh, or joining us on the phone, or read it aloud. A deliberative dialogue differs from other forms of public discourse, such as debate, negotiation, brainstorming, consensus building, because the objective is not so much to talk together as to think together, not so much to reach a conclusion as to discover where a conclusion might lie. Thinking together involves listening deeply to other points of view, exploring new ideas and perspectives, searching for points of agreement, and bringing unexamined assumptions into the open. So 
We're just hoping everyone can hold that in the back of their minds as we move forward here. Um, this was offered in some of the material that we shared as part of the first deliberative dialogue and the second deliberative dialogue around this topic. I won't go through each of the differences between deliberative dialogue and debate, but just want to make sure that everyone's aware that they are two very different things. All right, and I just want to cover protocols really briefly here. Um, again, purpose of the dialogue is to understand and learn from each other. Just a reminder, this isn't a debate. We're not trying to find flaws with each other's reasonings or thoughts. Um, and there is no right answer. This really is exploratory. We want everyone to speak for themselves, hoping everyone can do that. Um, and in dialogue, everyone is an equal here. Um, we want everyone to be listened, but open, excuse me, and listen to others, especially if you don't agree. Um, listen carefully and respectfully to the views of others and acknowledge you've heard each other, especially when you disagree. We really are looking for common ground here. Um, my job here is to objectively guide the discussion forward. And again, during the meeting, we really ask that if you have any technological concerns, you direct those to the staff. Um, that really helps us move our, our meeting along smoothly. And again, just a reminder, this is a public work session, so anything shared has the potential to become part of a public record. All right, so we'd like to take some time here to introduce our panelists. Um, if our panelists would like to turn on their cameras, um, I see Jessica first, so if you go ahead and give us a brief introduction. Um, you bet. Thanks, Kathy. My name is Jessica Tanani. I am CEO of Vertibio Research. We have a cannabis research license in the state of Washington. We focus mainly on um, breeding plant genetics for uni unique uh, phenotypes. And I think I'm here mostly on kind of the characteristics of the cannabis plant and genetics around what's possible with the cannabis plant. And so that's my introduction. Great. Thank you. Uh, Brad. Thank you, Kathy. Great to be here, everyone. My name is Brad Douglas. My background is as an organic and medicinal chemist. Professionally, I've been a technical and regulatory affairs consultant in the areas of drugs, dietary supplements, and food. And with respect to cannabis, my company, The Workshop, is a type of scientific consultancy, particularly dealing with matters of manufacturing and lab operations. Great. Thank you. All right, Nephi. Hi, everybody. Uh, so I'm I'm Nephi Stella. I'm a professor in the Department of Pharmacology at the Medical School at the University of Washington. I'm also the director of the University of Washington Center for Cannabis Research, and I've been doing uh, I've been in the this field of research for about 25 years, starting by thinking about endogenous cannabinoids, which we'll be talking about today. And the main area of interest that we currently have in my laboratory is to try to understand how we can optimize the medical properties of cannabinoids. And I'm looking forward to the discussion today. Thank you very much. Uh, David. Hi, yeah, my name is David Gang. I'm a professor at Washington State University on the opposite side of the state from Nephi. Um, I'm in the Institute of Biological Chemistry there in the College of Agriculture, Human and Natural Resource Sciences. I'm also the Assistant Director of the Office of Research in our college. Um, and I'm a plant biochemist. I've been studying how plants make compounds like the cannabinoids for like 25, 30 years almost now. That's my area of interest in research. Thank you very much. Um, and Nick, you just uh, came on camera. Do you want to introduce yourself really quick? I know I sort of gave a mini introduction, but <laughs> go ahead. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Nick Pullman, Washington State Liquor and Cannabis Board Chemist. Uh, I'm here to help co-moderate with Kathy today. All right, thank you, everyone. And I just want to say, I realize the screen presentation is 
probably not what I want right now, but I am really concerned that if I press the wrong button, I'm going to shut everything down. So bear with me. I apologize. Oh, all right. Uh, so, um, and I, I think we jumped a little bit ahead here, but we are talking, I just want to talk about dialogue um, format really quick. Um, our panelists have already introduced themselves. Then we will begin the moderated panel discussion after we do um, in a, a, a little bit of audience um, uh, introductions through the chat box. And then following that, we will be, um, begin our open discussion with um, our community who's joined us today. So in the chat box, if you could um, provide your name, who you are affiliated with or represent, if you're comfortable sharing that, and why you are interested in this topic today, we'd love to hear from you. Um, we'll give that about five minutes, and um, that'll get us started a little bit earlier on the discussion, about five minutes early. So um, looking forward to hearing from everyone in the chat box. I think Jason Bull just asked, is this the spot for introductions? Yes, it is in the chat box. Okay, I'm not seeing a lot of activity there. So I think I'd like to just move um, into panel discussion if the panel is ready for that. Sounds good. Okay, great. All right. And I think we already did our panel's discussion, so we'll just move right into the questions. All right. So our first question is, what are the three general categories of cannabinoids. And um, I'm going to have to put myself on mute here for a minute. So, Nick, I'm going to kick it over to you. But if you want to start this and um, uh, I can move into the slide that we've prepared to discuss this panel, or if you'd like to start speaking first, let me know how, how you'd like to go about this. Yeah, I mean, yeah. This is a pretty open-ended question for the group. Uh, what are the three general categories of cannabinoids? And then I think we have a lot of specificity to go into here, but let's start, let's start broad. Right, and I think we were gonna start with David kicking us off on this question. Okay, sounds good. Actually putting up that next slide would be helpful, I think. So as we were thinking about this, how to answer this question, and decided that maybe a, a little diagram like this might be helpful for people. Uh, there's actually three categories there. One is called phytocannabinoids. It's also, we, we, we added phyto to the beginning to indicate these are the compounds that came from the plant originally. They're produced by cannabis sativa. Then there's endocannabinoids. Those are produced in, for example, the human body uh, that are the natural endogenous compounds in our bodies that uh, bind to the cannabinoid receptors naturally, and it's that interaction between that endocannabinoid receptor and these compounds that 
does the normal natural physiological process that our bodies uh, normally are involved with. And it's that process that gets kind of hijacked by delta 9 THC when it comes in to play and binds to that receptor. And then there's also another group of compounds called artificial cannabinoids. Um, the top two, the phytocannabinoids and endocannabinoids, these are natural compounds. They are produced by a biological system. Uh, endocannabinoids are by human bodies or other animals, uh, and also by some plants. Uh, phytocannabinoids are compounds that are produced by plants. Um, I think the traditional definition or term was just cannabinoids, but because of a lot of discussion and, and kind of confusion in the in this space, we decided to put that the prefix phyto on the beginning of that to make it a little bit clearer to people then so that this would be more readily understood across the board. Um, examples of phytocannabinoids are things like uh, minus trans delta nine tetrahydrocannabinol, minus trans delta eight tetrahydrocannabinol, uh, uh, CBD or cannabidiol, or a whole bunch of other compounds. There's about 125 of these or so that have been identified in the, in the plant species of cannabis sativa. I want to point out that they have not been identified or demonstrated to have been identified in any other plant species so far. And I've been doing some more looking on that just to see, and I, I still can't find any evidence for that. They seem to be specific to this one species. They're not even found in the cousin hops. Hops are in the same plant family in the cannabaceae as, as, as cannabis sativa. They don't produce these compounds either. They seem to be pretty specific to cannabis sativa, which is pretty interesting actually. Uh, but that's that's the plant that makes them. It could be that other plants do make them. That is possible. Um, we've only scratched the surface in characterizing what plants make. Plants probably make about a million at least different types of chemicals. Um, we've only identified about a couple hundred thousand of those. Um, it's possible, that, and we've only looked at about five to maybe ten percent of the plant species. Less than five percent in any detail. Maybe ten percent have been looked at. at, at a superficial level. So it is possible that some other plant species might make these compounds, but it doesn't seem very likely. The endocannabinoids, on the other hand, those are produced in animal systems. They're produced by plants. An example of that is anandamide. Um, that's one that most people are most familiar with. Um, it's the signaling molecule that plays an important role in our physiology and, and helps brain function, things like that. Those are natural compounds. They're produced by biological systems. Um, it's also possible that they can be synthesized chemically in the lab. That's why those little circles overlap into the synthetic section down below. Synthetic compounds can either be these endocannabinoids or phytocannabinoids that have been synthesized in the lab. It's the same exact molecule, T delta 9 THC, the minus trans delta 9 THC. If you make it in a lab or extract it from hemp or from recreational or medicinal cannabis, it's the same exact molecule. It's the same thing. It just comes from different sources. You can also synthesize it in the lab. There are other compounds that are like the plus version. It's like we, in our previous version, we talked about there's like uh, handed versions, the minus and the trans. That's in, if you think about hands, it might be helpful. One of the versions, the, the trans, the minus trans version is like the left handed version. The plus version would be like the right handed version. They're really similar, but they're not superimposable exactly, right? You can't put a glove designed for your left hand on your right hand. It doesn't work very well, if, especially if it's a well fitting glove. So they're not exactly the same molecule. They're similar, but they're not the same. If you synthesize these compounds in a lab, most of the chemical syntheses that are involved in making them are not specific for handedness. And so you get a mixture of both left and right handed versions. Okay. So it's kind of like if you're at a thing like the gloves, if you're at a glove factory that makes left handed gloves and another one that makes right handed gloves, um, if, if you do the synthesis, the way that these are made can be made in the lab, it's like, mixing those up. You don't know which handed you're going to get. You get an equal mixture of those. Okay, the synthetic compounds, those are different. Those are things that are, um, I'm sorry, in the synthetic, there's also a group down there in red called artificial cannabinoids. These are molecules that bind to the receptor, for example. Um, things like K2 and spice fit under this category. They're artificial molecules. They're not found in natural systems. They're not made in, in the human brain. They're not made in plants. They were made in a chemical lab, and they are but they do have activities that might overlap with the activities of the endocannabinoids and the phytocannabinoids. So these are things that are 100% only produced synthetically. They're not natural, they're artificial. Delta-9 THC is not artificial, it's a natural compound. Now you may make it synthetically in the lab or you may extract it. I know I'm repeating myself here a little bit, but I kind of want to make sure everybody's clear on this, right? So you could make it synthetically in the lab or you can um, isolate it, but it's not an artificial 
cannabinoid. It's a true cannabinoid that's made by natural systems. So those and are the three kind of general categories. Yes, Jessica. And David, I was I think one of the things you brought up is kind of important is the handedness and kind of the fact that these molecules interact with receptors in the body. And that handedness, it's kind of like if you inverted a key, it might not work in the lock any, anymore. Yep, yep. It might work too well or not as well in the lock and key system. And that's why that handedness is important, is it may interact differently with the receptors in the body. Then the left-handed version may interact different than the right or inversely. Yeah, and we know, for example, that the cis versions or the minus or the plus versions, so those have been tested for activity versus the minus trans versions. And there's a like a hundredfold or more difference in activity, much, much less potent, or if at all. So there's a, exactly what you said. They don't function the same. So they're not the same molecule, even though they may have a really similar name, they're not the same molecule. And I think one of the things that that we talked about kind of in our pre meeting was the fact that something could be a synthetically synthesized phytocannabinoid that they're not exclusive. You can you can synthesize phytocannabinoids and they're still the same molecule. Right, right. No, exactly right. So that minus trans delta nine tetrahydrocannabinol. If you synthesize it in a chemical synthesis lab. I mean, and Brad can talk about this. He's a synthetic chemist, right? If you synthesize that in the lab or you extract it from the plant, it's the same exact molecule. Now, an important point here is that synthesis is not always 100% efficient. And there's going to be side products. There's going to be side reactions that occur in that synthetic process. You're going to get other compounds that are byproducts of the synthesis that are not natural compounds. And it's possible that depending on how that's done, you may or may not have higher levels of some of these contaminants in a synthesis process. So that is something that is important to consider, right, Brad? Definitely agree, David. One thing I would add in talking about synthetic and natural that I've found is useful to overcome the ambiguity of the term synthetic is to refer to compounds that are produced by chemical synthesis. Rather than just synthetic, there's some people start conflating with artificial. I like to refer to synthetic cannabinoids as we're using them here as cannabinoids produced via chemical synthesis. Uh, Nick, any follow up questions or anything from the? I feel like we talked about this question quite a bit in our previous <laughs> and we came up with this, or I shouldn't say we. You came up with this um, really great slide to make the distinctions between these different cannabinoids. And I think that's been something we've had uh, some challenges kind of unpacking. Um, go ahead, Nick. Yeah, uh, I mean, I think the panel did a great job. Uh, I guess one of my own curiosities is have you seen much chemical synthesis of endocannabinoids like 2AG or anandamide? The nothing yeah. question. Yeah, I, I can answer that. Yes, we can actually uh, synthesize these uh, endocannabinoids in the lab. If and if I remember well, most of the synthesis is actually quite simple. It happens in two to three steps. So, uh, yep, it can be synthesized in the lab. So that's why we can have this uh, in the Venn diagram, the endocannabinoid blue circle. That's why we can have some endocannabinoids that are in the synthetic. Uh, portion. I guess one thing to uh, maybe also emphasize and is something that we will be talking about a little bit later is that this Venn diagram is really based on the chemical structure of the compounds. Whether, you know, this compound has that chemical structure and it's produced by natural by the plant or in the lab, but it's a classification based on the um, chemical structure. There's no indication in this Venn diagram of the functionality. What is the bioactivity of the compound? And that's that'll be a, a, what we'll be talking about in our third uh, question. And, and Nick, also, I think, um, for example, truffles produces endocannabinoids. So there are some actual production as well outside of the human by natural sources of endocannabinoids. 
Yeah, oh, I th oh, maybe I'll just add to that. Um, it appears that evolutionary, actually, the endogenous cannabinoids have been used very early on by multiple organisms. And it's a molecule that allows cells to communicate between each other. So one cell will produce the endogenous cannabinoid and the other cell will have the receptor and therefore will know that there's been some endocannabinoids that have been produced. So it's a mean of communication between cells in our body. And it's been used very early on in very primitive and simple organisms already. And it's been perfected during the evolution. And today, like in a human body, the endogenous cannabinoids are produced in the brain because we think about how cannabinoids will affect our, 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 our brain function. But endocannabinoids are, it's actually hard to find cells in our body that do not produce cannabinoid, endocannabinoids and do not express cannabinoid receptor. So it's a very fundamental signaling system that the body uses to communicate. And as David was saying, um, I believe th the way to think about it is while we have our endogenous cannabinoid signaling system, what the phytocannabinoids and the synthetic art artificial cannabinoids will do is hijack that system and act on the same receptor. And we'll come back to that. And I think the one of the big uh, differences when you start thinking about functionality is that these molecules don't act the same way on the receptor. So the bioactivity is going to be different. And actually, that, that leads to... An, go, ahead. go ahead. Yeah, that leads to another point I want to emphasize too, and that is that in the class, for example, of phytocannabinoids, you know, like I said, there's about 125 of these that have been identified from cannabis sativa. Very few of them have the biological function that Nephi was just talking about, right? Only like a handful. Uh, most of them do not interact with that receptor at all. Most of them don't have any, as far as we know, um, kind of function that affects uh, the brain at all. Most of them are pretty benign or innocuous as far as the human body is concerned. A few of them may affect other pathways, right? There's been claims and some evidence that suggests, for example, that CBD is involved in maybe some anti-inflammatory properties that might help your body deal with inflammation, right? A completely different process from what we're talking about with the endocannabinoid system and that receptor, completely different. So it's possible that a plant can make multiple compounds that have different activities that are beneficial or, or medicinally active in the human body. And this pathway, the, cannab the phytocannabinoids, uh, fit that description very well. So only a very few of, the, of these compounds in this class, in this chemical structural class, as Nephi said, and I think that's important to emphasize, very few of them are actually active in the way that we think is important as far as the LCD should be concerned, right? In terms of being able to impair somebody or, or anything like that. I wanted to emphasize, I, I've, emphasized, I've said that several times, I think it's important to emphasize. <laughs> Right, the most so we're, compounds out of the 125, I'd say probably 120 of them have, have no impact whatsoever on a discussion related to how somebody's brain functions. As far as we know, now it's possible some of them do something that haven't been tested yet, um, but it's, it doesn't seem very likely that they're gonna be very potent, at least at this point. So really from a, a impairment or psychoactivity, we're really looking at the THCs. Yeah. Is yeah. that a fair assessment? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. And it's also important to point out sometimes some definitions for cannabinoids have been compounds extracted from the cannabis sativa plant. The problem with that is that, that, you know, there's thousands of compounds that this plant makes. And most of those compounds are the same compounds that make up our bodies, like amino acids, sugars, lipids, fats, all those things that make up our cells, they make up the plant cell as well. And none of those things have anything to do at all with the signaling pathway that affects, you know, how, why people use cannabis sativa for medicinal or recreational or other purposes. So you can't just say that because it comes from this plant, it should be called a cannabinoid. That actually doesn't make any sense at all from a biological or biochemical perspective. Examples are <laughs> terpenes are important compounds we know about. It makes a lot of flavonoids, which are common to lots and lots of all plants as well. Jessica, you gonna say something? Oh, I was gonna say, and David, like inversely, I've also heard people say, you know, interaction with the CB1 receptor knocks a molecule into the phytocannabinoids. And I think we had a little bit of discussion about how actually proving that would make it, you know, near near impossible to kind of classify molecules within within that space, but that had been used as a classification for 
Yeah, and I think the yeah. artificial cannabinoid class kind of defines that, right? These are compounds that are completely unrelated structurally. Speci you know, so they don't have the same backbone structure as the what we call the phytocannabinoids here, but they bind to that receptor because they have a three-dimensional shape. The final three-dimensional shape is similar, even though chemical structure is a little bit is or a lot of it different, right? Um, so they bind to that receptor and have the same function, but they belong to completely different chemical classes. Yeah. So, so really, you got to think about both of those things. Yeah, go ahead, Brad. The, some terminology that we introduced in the first deliberative dialogue was psychotropic versus psychoactive. And I think what we're talking about here is anything THC related that has some CB1 activity is psychotropic, whereas things may have an impact on the body that may even have some other type of impact in the brain is psychoactive. But that class of psychotropic cannabinoids is very small, as both of you are saying, David and Jessica. Yes. And okay, I'm, I'm going to build on this, on this, uh, on a couple of, of things that we talked about. I think the the comparison with the key lock is a really good one. I think there's one lock that we can think about, which is the receptor, the cannabinoid CB1 receptors, and the most famous key for this CB1 receptor lock is delta nine THC. Now we're starting to actually talk about other phytocannabinoids like delta-8 THC, and that's also a key that will open the same lock, the CB1 receptor. The second lock that the field has discovered is the, the receptor that is activated by cannabidiol. And cannabidiol is a very different system, and therefore the lock is very different. The molecule is somewhat similar to THC, but it'll open a completely different do door and therefore it will have a very different bioactivity. Uh, and then the third way to think about it is that there might be some receptors or lock that we have not discovered. Probably the one we'll hear about in the near future is the receptor for cannabigerol, because cannabigerol seems to have what I call bioactivity. It's changing the biological system, but we don't understand uh, what the receptor is or what the lock is. And then the final category is what David was referring to as phytocannabinoids that don't do anything. Even though you absorb them into your body, there are no lock or no receptor that it can engage, and therefore it will not produce any bioactivity. So that's kind of how I think about it. I think about bioactivity as molecule that affect the biological system, and I think about psychoactive and psychotropic as a molecule that affects the brain and the mind function. I completely agree, Nephi. And you know, to add a little bit complexity to it, I um a lot of people utilize CBD and THC at the same time. And one of the things that I, I tell people is is CBD doesn't necessarily like the CB1 receptor, but it likes to interfere with it. So I, I say imagine you have a whole set of keys and you have to find the right key sometimes you you know it takes time and what the cbd does is kind of blocks that that receptor it takes it slows things down some and so you know there's even this interaction that goes on within the molecules even if they don't like the receptor kind of interfering with the molecules that do like the receptors yeah the cannabinoid yeah. cb1 receptor is a fascinating protein it's we could actually push it to the next level it's it's a lock that has two slots for keys, one for THC that will open it and one for CBD that will slow it down. That's what you're talking about. I have to say the, the lock and key analogy is great. Um, I, I, I can just see that as a diagram of how all these things work. That would be a really great visual. Um, I think for a lot of us, who don't do what you folks do <laughs> to make sense of this. So that I really appreciate the that part of the I appreciate all of the conversation. Um I wanted to go back, Brad, um you gave kind of a definition for uh let me find it on my note here. Rather was it second? No, it was rather than saying synthetic cannabinoids, you could say 
um, products that are produced by chemical synthesis. Correct. Does, is every I see lots of heads nodding. Does that is that everybody kind of agree with that? I think it's an easier way to understand the process. Okay. All right. I wanted to circle back to that. The other thing I wanted to circle back to was Brad, if you had to define artificial in this space, how would you define it? Um, to, to, to reiterate, I suppose, what David had touched on, artificial is something that's not found in nature. So where the endocannabinoids are produced by animals or humans, phytocannabinoids produced by plants, artificial cannabinoids are chemical cannabinoids that are not found in nature. Um, full stop. Thanks. In our last meeting, we used the color example, right? Food coloring. Right. So there are, for example, red coloring. There are red agents that are made by uh, insects or plants or whatever. Beets make some. And anyway, many different examples of that that are red that make your food red. And then there's artif there are these artificial compounds that are red. And those can be used in food to make your food red. But some of them are natural compounds and some of them are not. Some of them are artificial. And I'd say we have a good example. I mean, we have a number of examples here of artificial cannabinoids. Some are letter and number combinations that most people aren't familiar with. But I'll direct everybody's attention to the last one on the list. And I'm going to draw his attention to it as a sort of public service announcement, too. So if THC acetates. THC acetates are similar structurally, so they're analogs of THC, which are phytocannabinoids, but they're not found in nature. So they're a product of chemical synthesis and they're artificial. I particularly draw everybody's attention to them now because THC acetates have a similar reaction, a similar degradation reaction when introduced to heat as vitamin E acetate. So if you're on the web, you may have noticed that Delta THC acetate has become a popular thing. There's people out there that are considering putting THC acetates in vape pens or considering vaping them themselves. Don't. They could end up with the same sort of situation as with Evoli and the ketene degradation potentially with THC acetates. So that's an aside, but figure it's worth everybody being aware of that at this point in time. Thank you very much for that, Brad. Appreciate it. All right, panel, is there anything else for question one? Any follow up last thoughts? Um, Nick, any questions you want to throw out there that you haven't? Uh, yeah, I just kind of had a quick question towards Nephi's two lock situation on CB1 is, you know, we've talked about there's at least some different molecules that will interact with uh, active site on CB1. Um, and you said that CBD, CBD uh, is a competitive inhibitor or an agonist. I don't know which term to, is better to use there, but it, is it possible or is there any research looking into other um, antagonist to that site as well, like that would also take that CBD spot. Absolutely. So uh, we um, in recent in recent years, the field has been able to get the crystal structure of the cannabinoid CB1 receptor. So now we have a three dimensional view at the atomic level of how the receptor is organized. And what we saw was that the lock the binding site where these compounds are coming in is actually a pretty big pocket. So that's probably why both phytocannabinoids and synthetic artificial cannabinoids can bind to the same receptor because the lock is actually pretty big. So you can hijack it pretty easily. Now that we have this crystal um, structure, we can see that there's not only one big pocket where THC binds and endocannabinoids, but there's another pocket where CBD can actually bind. So that's the second lock. The pharmacological term is a negative allosteric modulator. So it modulates in the negative way the effect of THC. So that's why it's, it, it reduces the effect of THC. And to your question, can we actually find new molecules? 
I am there. I, I pretty, th I think so very much. So the, uh, one of the most recent Nobel prize in chemistry is called evolutionary chemistry. And they're able to synthesize millions, almost billions of different types of synthetic molecules. So in those big libraries of molecules that people are designing in the lab, there is a very high likelihood that there will be some of those molecules that will be excellent keys for this second lock where CBD acts on the CB1 receptor. It's actually a very exciting field of research because you can think about a lot of medical properties in modulating the CB1 receptor. Great question. Jessica, I think you were, you were uh, going to say something. Oh, before Nick talked, I, I think when you asked what, you know, what takeaway did you want from this question? I think one of the takeaways is that a molecule can be both natural and synthetic. Um, I think that's a really important takeaway from this. Um, they're not mutually exclusive and they can be the same molecule that's either made in nature or synthesized there the quality of synthesis means oftentimes you're not just left with the molecule you're looking for but if you have a pure delta 9 pure delta 9 it's the same molecule whether it's natural or synthesized it's a question of what else is in that solution of of molecules Uh, any any other final thoughts on question one before we move on? Okay. Thanks, everyone. We'll move on to question two. All right. So, is there a way to determine? which cannabinoids are impairing and to make relative comparisons between different cannabinoids, both exogenous and endogenous. And Nephi, if you could start this question off, that would be great. Okay. Yeah, I'm happy to. It's, my goal is for everyone to become an expert in cannabinoid pharmacology. So I'm gonna give some basic uh, um, fundamentals. Uh, most of the terms that we'll be using are actually quite difficult to um, to to define, and and the first one that comes to mind right here is the word um, impairment. The uh, so as I, as we as we started our discussion, we started by the fact that there are some cannabinoids that are going to be bioactive, which means that they are going to affect the biological system. They are going to affect our body. And they can affect the body in, in very different ways. The, the first terms that we talked about in terms of bioactivity is affecting the mind, the brain functions. So whether it's psychotropic or psychoactive, those are the result of, of this bioactivity on, on, on the brain. These, um, the effect of cannabinoids, and I'm going to start fo focusing on delta-9 and very similar with delta-8. The psychoactivity of these compounds is actually quite complicated. Uh, the first thing that people talk about when they say this is a psychoactive molecule is that it will change our sensory awareness. So for example, music is much more salient and, and that's what how people think about the cannabinoids producing the high. So that's, that would be one way to think about the bioactivity of THC on the brain. The other way of thinking about the bioactivity of THC on the brain is that it's going to be impairing. And the way we think about that, uh, the most, the easiest readout of impairment that we can see in animals and in humans is impairment of locomotor activity. People have a tendency to actually not function um, uh, correctly at very high doses. So that would be an impairment, which is why there's actually concern about driving under the influence of, of THC. If your locomotor activity is impaired, you might actually increase the risk of, of, of accidents. So already we, we started with bioactivity on the brain. We have changes in sensory awareness. That's the high. 
we have impairment on motor activity, but actually the bioactivity on the brain could be medical. And that's a very different way of thinking about the bioactivity. It can produce analgesia, could, so that means reducing pain. It can stimulate appetite, hunger, or it can actually even have an effect on the biology of, of, our, of our immune system. So the bioactivity of compounds is actually really com complicated to define. It can be a high, it can be an impairment, or it can be a, a, a medical uh, property. So I just wanted to kind of set the stage with those definitions, because how can we determine, this question might be more precise if we could say, how can we determine which cannabinoid is bioactive and then think about what type of bioactivity it is, it is producing. So what we need to do these determination of bioactivity of impairments is we need reliable readouts. We need measurements. We need to be able to measure how are these compounds producing this bioactivity or this impairment. And most likely one way that the, we need to think about that for the future is that this readout probably needs to have multiple uh, results. Um, because the cannabinoids produce such a diversity in the bioactivity. So that's to start thinking about the bioactivity of the compounds. So how, being a pharmacologist, how do we measure bioactivity of, of a compound? And here there's more words, that, more terms that are difficult to actually understand and, and define. The first one is potency. So a compound what is a very potent compound? So the way to think about that in pharmacology is a potent compound is a compound that will act at low dose. So THC is a very potent compound at the cannabinoid CB1 receptor. It acts on this receptor at very low doses. So that will be one of the, the readouts of bioactivity of THC, potency. The other way to think about the bioactivity is not the concentration, but the biological response. Is it producing a full biological response or is it producing a partial biological response? And here, an easy example to think about is the effect, is to compare the effect of THC versus some of the synthetic can, cannabinoids that act on the CB1 receptor. K2 has been mentioned, the synthetic compound. The synthetic compounds are what we call full agonists. They fully activate the receptor, so they produce very strong responses. Whereas THC actually is what we call a partial agonist, which it activates the CB1 receptor, but it produces a partial response. So when we get into the discussion of how can we characterize different type of cannabinoids, and that's actually how it's done for the Schedule One license, the route to define a cannabinoid in terms of functionality is there are several steps that one needs to, um, needs to address. The first one is a um, biochemical step. So the first question, if we discover a new compound, synthetic, and the question is, is this going to be a cannabinoid agonist at the CB1 receptor? Is it going to be impairing? The first thing that people will do is test whether the compound is interacting directly with the CB1 receptor. So that's a biochemical assay. You do that in the lab, you have your little tubes, you add THC, and you see that THC binds to the CB1 receptor. You have an unknown compound, you put it into your little tube, and you look at if the compound binds and activates the CB1 receptor, and it does. According to that first criteria, this new compound is going to be a cannabinoid CB1 agonist. The second criteria is we're going to move into a more complicated system. From the tube where we do a biochemical assay, we're going to test whether the cannabinoid is producing a behavior in mice. So the field have studied for decades how mice respond to cannabinoid compounds. And therefore we understand the, bio, the, the bioactivity of cannabinoids in mice. There's typical behaviors, including, for example, impairment of locomotor activity. 
mice stop moving, they stop walking around. So that's impairment of locomotion. So that's our second level of investigation in a more complex system, which is the mouse. And then the third level is to try the compound in humans. Of course, this is not commonly done. This is done only in ter terms of research. And in this case, there's been quite a bit of papers that have been published uh, at NIH, where you had subjects that would arrive in the laboratory, you would provide them with the cannabinoid compounds. They did it mainly with THC. The individual takes THC, and they're actually individuals that have used cannabinoids before, so they actually know the sensation. And they rate, they rank the biological activity of these compounds in human. And this is what we call the subjective high. So there's a scale and people can actually take this compound THC and then they rate how the bioactivity of this compound, how high is it? Is it. And uh, so THC will reach a certain level. And if you, the individual would to take a very a synthetic cannabinoid like spice, the activity would actually be much, much, much bigger. All of these assays, the biochemical in a tube, the mice, in a lab and the humans in, a, in, in, in terminal at NIH, all these bioassays have been actually uh, validated. And the way you validate that is you give the compound THC and then you add a blocker, an antagonist to block the receptor and you show that THC doesn't work anymore. So if you do that in the biochemical assay, you do a block, you add a blocker and it won't bind anymore. You add it to a mouse, you have the bioactivity of the mouse you have the blocker, it doesn't work anymore. And even in humans, they did it, where the, the human subject takes THC, has the psychotropic effect, you add the antagonist, the blocker, and it doesn't work anymore. So the field has actually this process of defining what a cannabinoid is at the functional level by testing biochemically in rodents and mice and in humans, and therefore, is there a way to answer this question? Is there a way to determine which cannabinoids are impairing? Impairing is hard, but maybe bioactive and make a relative comparison between different types of cannabinoids, exogenous and endogenous. That would be the process. The easier one is you have a new cannabinoid you tested in biochemically, next step in mice. And then if very important, then we can also test it in humans. So that would be the first way to think about that. So in our discussions, Nephi, you briefly stepped through the, the timeline for going through those three different approaches, biochemical, in mice, in humans. And I thought that was helpful for us as a panel and then probably helpful for people to understand um, in, in this case related to cannabinoids. Yes, I, I think so. These experiments are actually increasing in complexity. So it's actually quite easy to test compounds biochemically. So the timeline could be very rapid. A lot of laboratories have these biochemical assays in place. You just give the compound and you can say yes or no. Is it activating the cannabinoid receptor? Is it a full agonist? Is it very potent acting at small concentration? All these questions can be addressed quite quickly biochemically. The next level uh, would probably take more, more like months where you would actually have, because these mice actually are trained to recognize cannabinoids. They're used to press that little lever and they know that they're gonna get THC and they recognize the sensation. So the way, actually my understanding, the way the DEA um, goes through the process of classifying these drugs is first they do the biochemical assay if it binds to the cannabinoid receptor, then they test it in mice. And these mice are trained to recognize THC. Every day they press a little THC and they get the psychotropic effect. And then one day, instead of giving THC, you give this new compound that is unknown. And if the mouse presses for the lever, it means that it has the same sensation as THC. And that would take several months to actually figure it out and then my understanding that is the time where if the mouse recognizes that this new compound is acting just like THC, that new molecule will end up on the schedule one. So at least several months. 
to test a compound in humans, I imagine that would actually take years because then you need to you need to justify uh, with the IRB and it would probably have to be justified. You couldn't test every compound. It would have to have a very strong justification just because it's, we're not allowed to give everything to humans. We need to go through the IRB. Does that help? That was great. One of the things you talked about, Nephi, was a blocker. And if we kind of go back to our lock and key, I think of a blocker just kind of to, you know, put it in easy context is like putting glue in the key hole so you can't use your key anymore. I don't know if there's a better analogy. That's a good one. I like that. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It's 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 a key that gets into the lock but doesn't open. It breaks. <laughs> or it breaks well the, the antagonist the blocker can also come out yeah i agree absolutely so maybe i'll add one more thing because i see at the end of this uh this question there's a comparison between exogenous and i'm going to think about exogenous as phytocannabinoids or synthetic cannabinoids that act on the cb1 receptor um compared to endogenous cannabinoids that are produced by the by our cells so one of them, the, the, and one of the questions that we get is, okay, so THC is the exogenous drug. It will act on the CB1 receptor and you're impaired. Why are we impaired if we're actually, our body is producing also these endogenous cannabinoids? And, and the difference here is in how long the molecule, the key stays into the lock. Because the endogenous cannabinoids are produced by cells and they use that to communicate you communicate much better if you send a message and then it stops. So the communication, the activation of the CB1 receptor by the endogenous cannabinoid is very short lived. It's a message, go on and this is the message. By comparison, when an individual takes THC, THC goes into our body, floods our brain and stays there for minutes. And therefore the lock, the key, stays in the lock for minutes or even hours. And that is why people think about changing the state of mind is because this lock has been engaged by that key for a long time, in minutes instead of seconds. And that continuous activation of the CB1 receptor changes the mindset and therefore could be either sensory awareness or impairment of locomotor activity. You're absolutely experts in the pharmacology of cannabinoids now. I've pretty much covered all the bases. There might be a quiz at the end, right? No, no, there's no quiz. <laughs> um, Nick, any follow-up questions that you'd like to offer? Yeah, Nappy, so you brought up something very interesting. Um, so I, I think this question kind of addresses uh, potentially what is the, let's say, maxima of the curve or the, the inflection point of binding. But you brought up, um, you, I'll say, area under the curve or integration. Uh, is there, do you think that one may be more valuable to think about than the other, meaning that like, if it is maybe doesn't have the highest inflection point, but has a longer curve, is that going to be as impairing or differently impairing um, as another cannabinoid? So this is a good question. And this is actually what a lot of researchers are thinking about, especially medicinal chemists who are trying to create new synthetic artificial cannabinoid molecules. Uh, because, you, uh, because the two, parameters that we have to think about is how potent the molecule is, which means it will act at very low concentrations and for how long. So we are able to actually design some molecules that will change, have different potency, work at very low concentration or at very high concentration, and that will activate the receptor key lock for different amount of times. And there are some thoughts that maybe by changing these parameters, we can actually optimize the medical properties of the cannabinoids versus the impairments. It's still a lot of work in progress. 
the field is, is, is extremely young. Our field of cannabinoid research is very young. It's been, um, it's, it's maybe 10 or 15 years be, behind the opioid uh, uh, field. When I started the cannabinoid okay. research 20 years ago, there were 100 and, 125 people at the International Cannabis Research Society. So very small field. And because of the legalization and the field starting to actually be interested in cannabinoids, now the field is much bigger. So I'm hoping that the research will go faster just because there's more researchers that are interested. Uh, one thing, um, Nafi, that, that maybe you can bring up is around toxicology. You know, I, I tell people all the time that Delta 9 is a relatively safe molecule as, as we know it. it a small amount of it can make you feel like you're going to die, but it would actually take a very large amount to die. Do you think there's different toxicology points or, um, you know, LD50s are essentially the lethal dose for 50% on, on these different molecules? Yes, yeah, so yeah. there's going to be, um, the toxicity is usually associated, is linked, each, each molecule will have its own toxicity profile. And in and it, it's true that the safety profile of cannabinoids is considered to be really good. They, they're very safe drugs because you can absorb them at very high concentration, and you will not have a heart attack or heart at arrest or, or or problems with your 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 blood pressure or things like that. And and that is due to the fact that the cannabinoid receptors are expressed in the brain but they're not expressed in key parts of the brain that control these organs. And, and the easy way to compare it again is the cannabinoids and the opioids. So the opioids, which is the same idea, we have the endorphins, that's the endogenous that we produce, and it acts on the opioid receptor, and we have the exogenous, the morphine, the heroin. While these locks for the opioid receptors are in the part of the brain that control heart rate, and respiration. So that's how you overdose from, from opioids is because these opioids are acting on those receptors in those part of the brains that are controlling. And because cannabinoid receptors are not expressed in those part of the brains, their initial safety profile is, is, is much better than, than opioids just because you will not have a heart attack following cannabinoids. However, Toxicity, there's always toxicity. It, it always it depends on how much you take and, and therefore there is toxicity that is, that is uh, associated with cannabinoids, but it's at very, very high concentrations and for very, very long amount of times. And the last thing I wanna say also about toxicity is that toxicity depends on how vulnerable you are. If you're a very strong individual, the toxicity will not be too bad. But if you're a vulnerable person, and what I'm thinking about is the adolescent population with their developing brain, there, there will be a toxicity profile that will be different just because they're more, they're more vulnerable to these compounds. So toxicity can also change with age. Nafi, could you also comment on acute versus chronic? Perspectives for toxicity in that regard, I think. For toxicity, maybe. yeah. So maybe commenting on the so the um, for for a molecule to be toxic and acute, it will have to be either that the lock the receptor is an area of the body that is fundamental for our life, like for opioids, if you were to go very, very high, um, and uh, so that would be the first. Thing to think about for uh, acute toxicity and for chronic toxicity, then it's different because sometimes chronic toxicity is not only associated with the molecule acting on the receptor, but the molecule being processed by our body by our and then by our liver, for example, and starting to produce metabolites. And if you use it chronically, maybe those some of those metabolites cannot be eliminated fast enough. And there's a different types of toxicity that can that can appear. So that's the first thing that come, comes to mind. Is that what you were thinking, David? Well, yeah, I think so. And I guess my question then is, is there any evidence for any chronic toxicity with these compounds? Well, um, 
the only the, the two that actually my lab is really interested in is chronic toxicity associated with chronic use of THC in adolescents. And and that, that toxicity is is a toxicity associated with changes in neuronal function. Because this cannabinoid system, so the receptor, the lock, and the endogenous cannabinoids that are signaling between cells. Our brain is using this signaling system to actually being built during, during development. And because in adolescent, the brain is not fully developed and it can go all the way to after 20 years old of age where the brain is still developing. As the brain is developing, the endogenous cannabinoids are using the cannabinoid receptors to form this brain. But if the brain is full of THC all the time, that signaling system is going to be impaired. It's going to be hijacked, and therefore the development is going to be uh, is going to be uh, affected. So that's why the toxicity in that term is for the vulnerable population of the adolescents. So. It might be a good point for me to interject this, and I know we're only on question two, and we got a little ways to go. Um, but Nephi elucidated how the DEA goes through the process of evaluating whether something has similar activity to a controlled substance. First, you have the biochemical step, then you have an animal step. This is essentially what undergirds the Federal Analog Act. So how you judge a new molecule is similar to something that's already been placed on the controlled substances schedule. And I wanted to read from the Analog Act, and it's a two-pronged test because I think it ties our first two questions together. And it's important because it shows how you interpret science in, into policy. So in the Federal Analog Act, the controlled substance analog is defined as something that has the chemical structure of which is substantially similar to the chemical structure of a controlled substance and which has a stimulant, depressant, or hallucinogenic effect on the central nervous system that is substantially similar to a controlled substance. So that two-pronged test essentially details the two different approaches to categorizing cannabinoids that we've been talking about. First, structurally, chemical similarity, and then with this question, functional similarity. And I, I think that this is important because when this definition was first uh, put down in statute, the DEA asserted that one of these was sufficient to bring a molecule under the, uh, the Analog Act. But the courts then decided that you need both of these things, both chemical similarity, so structural similarity and functional similarity to avoid sort of inane results. Like caffeine, for example, having stimulant activity and being judged a controlled substance. So I throw that out there just as some precedent um, in a way that the complexities of science is interpreted in I guess solving a similar problem. Brad, if, uh, if, caffeine, if caffeine ended up on the CSA, I think a lot of us would be at a big trouble. Yeah, big problem. Pitchforks and torches. <laughs> True. <laughs> and, and maybe I'll, I'll add to to what Brad was just saying. That's really interesting. The um, Federal Analog Act. The uh, when we we think about the functionality, you mentioned you know a stimulant, uh, a hallucinogen, hallucinant, or a depressant. The uh, one of the challenge with cannabinoids is they they're not actually in that category of psychotropic molecules. They're in the category which is very obscure, which is called mind altering drugs because they're not stimulants, they're not depressing. So even the definition of uh, that definition actually is probably should be adjusted for cannabinoids. Okay. Any other comments, Nick? Any follow up? I think we probably should move on. It, it is true we are only on question two. <laughs> we want to break at two thirty-five. Let's keep going. 
Okay. All right, on to questions three and four here. All right, so um, this question is for Brad. You kick us off. Do you think consumers should be informed whether a product has undergone a chemical synthesis? Absolutely, Kathy. So I'll offer again, I like to speak to precedent and what's been done in other regulated areas. So what I'll offer is in food, ingredients aren't typically labeled to whether they're natural or synthesized for food ingredients. As far as the FDA is concerned, if it meets the purity and other requirements of the substance, it's immaterial whether it's natural or synthetic. Now, the opposite is true when it comes to flavor compounds in food. So you are required to declare on your label whether you're using an artificial flavor compound or a natural flavor compound. And in this case, artificial refers to both natural compounds that are chemically synthesized and actual artificial flavors. So there's precedent for, for both ways. Now, in my opinion, it's, it hinges on whether the consumer thinks it's important. And this is something that consumers should be polled about, but also that industry and regulators should discuss. Is it important enough to put on the label? Does it have an impact? And do most consumers wanna know and is it important enough to take up label real estate that other important information could occupy? Um, so I think that's that's the test. How important is it? And if it really is important to consumers, then it should probably be declared on the label. Do others want to weigh in on that question? I thought Brad answered it really well, actually. Same. And, and Brad, we did have a little bit of discussion around, you know, what may need to be on that label and, and things like decarboxylation and things you had mentioned, Oregon had decided not to put that on. Can you speak to that at all? Oh, that's right. Yeah, that's a good point, Jessica. So the recent legislation in Oregon around this similar topic, they carved out decarboxylation as a chemical step the chemical alteration that wouldn't necessarily put it in the same category as something that's the product of chemical synthesis and there therefore wouldn't be subject to the same sort of disclosure requirements. Uh, so there's some sort of detailed decisions that would probably have to be made in categorizing what is something that's a product of chemical synthesis and what's not, what's natural. And I'll also add too, because I think we brought it up in our, our panelist discussion, a, a useful example. So tangible examples are helpful here. Citric acid. Citric acid is something that's pervasive in food, beverages. It's an acidifying agent. It was, or it's found naturally occurring in citrus fruits, hence the name citric acid. But essentially all citric acid that's used in commerce, in food and beverage products is synthetic. So you wouldn't know that from a product label because it's not declared, um, but it is the case that almost all citric acid that's currently used is the product of chemical synthesis. Same goes for caffeine, the caffeine heads. <laughs> oh, yeah. so Brad, oh, go ahead. I, I know you, we talked about this pre-panel, so this is a little bit of me cheating, but you said that, you know, for food, the molecule is the molecule, but for um, flavoring, chirality seems like a, a bigger deal, and I'll tie this back to our first point with the, the handedness. Um, it, at least in my view, it seems like cannabinoids have a lot of chirality and have a lot of stereo uh, importance to them. So do you do you think it kind of leans one way or another? I, I know you said that um, it should definitely come down to the consumer and the producer processor to have that conversation with policy, but would you say it leans one way or another in your view? Yeah, I think that's a good point, Nick, that when you're talking about molecules like caffeine or even citric acid, they're mostly achiral, pretty simple molecules. 
but a lot of your cannabinoids do have stereogenic centers and have chirality, which adds that multiple or additional level of, of complexity that makes this conversation about what disclosure should be provided to consumers more challenging. One one thing I think uh, we talked about Brad a little bit, and I talked about with David a little bit um, in different discussions, is the potential of, of testing for chirality. I know it's not necessarily available in 502 testing methods now, but can you kind of circle up, up on the fact that, that there is some potential for testing um, that? Yeah, absolutely. So there's. There's four different stereoisomers of let's talk just delta nine THC. Um, you have the trans plus, the trans minus, the cis minus, the cis plus. The cis aren't very common, and there's not much data about their synthesis. They can be synthesized, but they're not common. The trans minus is naturally occurring. The trans plus is commercially available as an analytical standard, and there are some instrumentation companies who have developed methods that allow you and their chiral separation methods that allow you to test and tell whether you have the trans minus or trans plus uh, chiral chromatography it's a pretty well-known form of chromatography but it allows you to discriminate between stereoisomers so can it be done there's some methods for some of them and there's analytical standards for at least the non-naturally occurring plus trans plus, uh, but some of the other stereoisomers are, although they've been characterized, aren't easily tested for. Yeah. Yeah. And one thing to add, Brad mentioned this a little bit in his comments there, but I want to emphasize is that the, to be able to do that kind of analysis to tell, you know, the chirality, that's a left and right hand again. To tell the left hand from the right hand, you have to have standards for those chira for those types of chiral separations to be able to know what you're really looking at. So if there isn't a good standard available, it's very, very difficult to do that kind of analysis. So availability of standards is really critical for that. Yeah, great point, David. Um, just to, how long does it take to create standards? For the audience, I think this is something that we've talked about a little bit before, but it, it takes it, a while, doesn't it? <laughs> it's, it's time and resources is the question, right? So for a cis isomer of delta 9 THC, you would first likely have to synthesize it. So to do that, you'd have to come up with a synthetic route. There's some routes in the literature. So you'd have to find the resources to produce that. Then you'd need a certified standard provider, at least if the standard is going to be provided commercially, to actually synthesize that, get the concentration exactly right, to be able to sell those to, to labs that can then use it to, to run the test. So it's, it's relatively involved. And and Brad, one of the things around that is it it's dependent on commercial need. The companies that are producing these standards are commercial companies. And so if there's a commercial need, they may have a little bit more emphasis to do it quicker. If there's no commercial, if they're only going to sell a couple of these a year, it may take substantially longer lead time. It, some of it is dependent on the commercial viability of creating the standard. That's very That's true. Really there has been instances in the past where companies that were looking to develop a new molecule saw the need for having the standards available, and they helped some of these standard creation companies with the material to help make sure that those standards are available so you could test the, you know, the quality of, of the products. So there's, a, there's an opportunity and, and perhaps a responsibility from industry, perhaps, just as much as there is maybe from a regulatory standpoint saying, okay, we need these to provide that impetus to create them. All right, thank you for that. I'm gonna move on to the next question. I don't mean to, to stop the conversation around this, but uh, it's almost 2.30 already. <laughs> oh, wait a minute, um, let me go back. Sorry, apologies. Um, what is the safety of the chemicals being used? 
So literature describes the use of sulfuric acid, hydrochloric acid, et cetera, et cetera, and other chemicals. And Brad, if you could start this or kick this question off for us. Absolutely. So in my mind, this is two separate questions. First, you have the safety of some of these compounds when they're in the finished product and at what level they show toxicity or are safe or not. And the second question is the safety of the processes and the, the people that are running these processes in facilities that are doing some of this stuff. And I think these are very, two very different questions. And if you look at the, the first one, the safety of some of these components in the finished product, if the finished product doesn't have these components, then it's immaterial whether they were used in the process. So if you can demonstrate that your product does not contain these, then great. It represents no safety hazard for consumers of those products. Um, but very importantly is how these compounds are used. Um, facilities that use these compounds, you have to have safeguards for employees, personnel that use some of these compounds. You have to have the right facility and equipment make sure you're not having exposure events and there's way that ways to handle all these compounds that are listed here safely but you do have to have some expertise you do have to have very in some cases very buttoned up procedures to do so so I don't know if it's speed enough so we're essentially looking at consumer safety and employee safety. Is that right, Brad? I think that's how you tease apart this question. Yeah. Absolutely. And, and there are, again, if I sound like a broken record, excuse me, but I think there's precedence for answering both questions. For the levels that are permitted in finished products, you have ICH levels for residual solvents, acids, things like that, that can be looked at. We've used those in the past in regulating cannabis for residual solvent levels and in terms of safety of chemicals being used, you know, we have OSHA and other requirements about what constitutes a safe working environment if using some of these compounds. All right, any, any other feedback? offerings from the panel. Nick, any follow-up question that you can think of? Uh, you know, we're getting very close to 2.35, so I don't want to push it too much. <laughs> All right. Well, I guess on that note, um, yeah, we are at 2.32. Um, panel, is there anything that you want to add before we um, stop for break? We've got a couple minutes. If there's any other odds and ends you wanted to speak to regarding any of the other previous questions um, before we break. All right. So uh, we will go ahead and take a break. We'll come back at 2.45. In the meantime, um, I will get the screen figured out so we can go back to sort of a regular presentation mode. Um, and we'll see everybody back at 2.45. Thanks very much.
All right. Uh, uh, do we have our panel back? It is 1245. Before we get going, I want to make sure everybody's here. Hello, Jessica and Nephi. All right. And there's Brad. We'll give David a minute to come on, but thanks for thanks for coming back. And there's David. All right. So we'll move into the participant um, question session. And again, just as a reminder, we did get receive. Um, uh, or I should say, four individuals reached out, um, providing multiple questions to us. So um, I uh, will provide those here in a minute. They are identified by who asked the question, uh, when we received it at LCB, and we'll go from there. Um, also, just want to remind everyone that um, every part of this um, deliberative dialogue today is a public record. So. Um, been a little bit of uh, activity going on in the chat that I think we might want to count down on a little bit. Uh, really appreciate if you could do that and let's um, really pay attention to um, our panelists today and the great information and expertise they're sharing with us. So I was able to uh, fix the presentation here, I'm happy to say. <laughs> now, if I can only advance it, that would be great. And that may not be happening, but oh, wait a minute. It is running too slowly. So give me a moment here, we'll go back. Not sure what's happening here. All right, let's go in the wrong way. Hang on one second, bear with me. All right, I believe that was the first question, set of questions we received. No, here's the first set of questions we received. All right, so this came on Monday from Kent and Audrey. Um, can we reach out and see if I believe that Kent has joined us today? Maybe we can unmute him so he can sort of speak to his question. Kent, you should be unmuted now if you'd like to speak. Yeah, I've got, a couple, I've got a couple questions you can see right here. I mean, um, some of these things came up a little bit earlier and uh, specifically around hemp um, derived THC being uh, uh, analytically identical. So you can see here, you know, my question is really, if we're talking about something that is the same because it's the same molecule, I mean, we're really talking about something that was created with a different method, but it's the same. So I guess this kind of tails off into discussions about whether something like this should have a distinction attached to it that it was made in a different way or synthesized, if we want to use that term. It doesn't seem to make a whole lot of sense to me when we're talking about cannabis made from cannabis. I'd be happy to address that. I think that's a good question, Kent. And I think that is the question at issue, whether THC from other sources is identical to THC found in cannabis. And I think for us on the panel here, at least I'll speak for myself, that is what is unclear. It's unclear whether THC produced from other sources is in fact minus trans Delta 9 THC, or are there other stereoisomers in there? And I, I think really that is the key issue. But from a safety and science standpoint, if two sources of THC, and I'm talking being chemically specific here, delta or minus trans delta 9 THC, it's the same molecule. It shouldn't matter where they come from, again, from a safety and science perspective. Thank you. And, and my second question was really focused on. Actually, you know, before, it, yeah, Ken, before you go into your second question, yeah. I'd like to add something to what Brad said. And that is from hemp, there's actually two ways you can get THC from hemp, right? One of those is it's THC is present in hemp in the acid form at low levels, right? Just like it is in. Uh, recreational or medicinal cannabis. It's just, you know, it's the same species. It's just been differentiated artificially by regulation to say this is one type 
that we're going to call cannabis, recreational and medicinal, and this is the other type, which we're going to call, call hemp. It's the same exact molecule produced in that species in those different types. Uh, in hemp, it has to be less than 0.3%. So you can extract it directly from hemp the same way you can extract it from other types of cannabis. The other way is you can take CBD that you extract from hemp, and then you can go through a synthetic process in the lab and convert that CBD into Delta 9 THC. And then at that point, the question goes back to what Brad said, what form did you actually produce? Did you produce 100% minus Delta 9, tra minus trans Delta 9 THC, or in that chemical synthesis process that you ran that CBD through, did you convert some of it into either the cis form, one of the two cis forms, or the plus form of the trans? And that's still an open question. It's going to depend on the chemical method chemical synthesis method that was used, as well as purification and other things like that. So it's going to depend on how you get it from hemp, whether or not it's the same molecule or not, or if it has a possibility be, to be converted into something else in that process. I just want to make sure that was really clear. Right. Thank you, David. Um, my next question is, in order for this to be done currently, uh, in a compliant manner following both the state law and the WAC using CBD isolate, both of those processes would require that the CBD isolate be tested for pesticides and heavy metals not once but twice. By contrast, all other marijuana products in Washington state are not required to pass a mandatory pesticide test for heavy metals, um, uh, for pesticides and heavy metals. I guess it's almost a rhetorical question, but you know, I would take the position and would ask the group here, you know, wouldn't this make a product made from a product like this, not the safest products inside of I-502, given that it's required to pass those tests and others are not required to be sold in I-502. Yeah, I can hey, say something to that real, oh, go ahead, Brad. I was going to say, unless you wanted to go, David, that there's different metrics of hazard. I like to talk about hazard rather than safety. And pesticide and heavy metal content is one metric of just determining the amount of hazard or the lack thereof. And I think the type of testing that you might need to do for evaluating stereoisomers, like we've been discussing a lot, is different from heavy metal and pesticides. Um, how that all wraps together is sort of unknown, but I think it's it's tough to categorize saying that they're the safest products in IFO2 just because they're tested for these two different metrics, but there's other things that could have an impact on the safety or hazard. That's pretty much what I was gonna say. Yep. <laughs> Thank you very much for your comments. I appreciate it. Great, thanks very much, Kent and panel. So let's see if I can move to the next slide. And I believe it was this one. This is from Rusty Sutherland. Um, Rusty, uh, or I'm sorry, Audrey, can you unmute Rusty, please? Actually, I think we might have skipped a question, but let's go ahead and, and go forward with Rusty's question. Rusty, you should be unmuted. Okay, can you guys hear me? We can. All right, great. Thank you, guys. So, hey, I appreciate you guys uh, taking taking time out of your busy schedules for this. Um, so, yeah, and uh, a couple of questions here. Um, you know, at, at first, you know. I, you know, listening to the term uh, synthetic or synthesized, uh, it does sort of get confusing. I can I can definitely see where where some of the the chaos uh, comes from there. Um, and I, and I was wondering, could uh, uh, would a better name for this be like a hemp source? Because as as we know, like you know, the Delta Eight uh, material, it is it does come from hemp. I, I do know we just talked about hey, the stuff that's you know below point three percent, and some of the other stuff that was uh, and derivatized from CBD. 
Um, so yeah, just you know, that I, I didn't know if that might make it a little bit simpler to uh, uh, you know, a phrase coined that says CBD uh, drive or hemp sourced uh, THC. Um, and uh, what, what's your thoughts on that one? Rusty, this is Jessica, and I think to some degree that's a marketing call, um, for lack of a better way to put it. Um, I think that the reality is is that CBD is being converted into Delta Nine, and so I, I don't know the best the best terms, but I think what we've been trying to do is is bracket that so people know natural versus synthesized versus artificial, and kind of try to give a pretty clean definition. I'm not I'm not sure it sounds like we might not have been extremely successful, but I don't know if anybody else on the panel has anything to say around that. Yeah, I'd, I'd say in my opinion, hemp source doesn't add anything to making the terminology more precise. So if we're chemically precise, we would say trans minus Delta nine THC, full stop. If it's the same molecule, it's the same molecule. It doesn't matter where where it comes from, from hemp, the moon, from yeast. It shouldn't matter. And I think that's the key: being precise in our terminology for chemically what these things are. Good point. Brad. And and maybe I'll add that uh, it's the same way to think about this in terms of pharmacology. The molecule, wherever it comes from, if it's exactly the same molecule, will have the same bioactivity, will produce the same biological effects. So we don't really, um, it's not very important in terms of the bioactivity, the pharmacology, where the molecule comes from. It will produce the same effect if they're exactly the same. Yes. Yeah, that, that's another point, though, and that is, are they exactly the same? So, Brad mentioned, if you get, you know, the purified compound, the question is, is the process that you're using to generate that compound, not extracting it from the plant, but generating it from another compound, is that going to, and, and there could be different people who use different processes that along the way, they may use different solvents that were mentioned on previous slides and earlier, et cetera. Different things could go on to produce that compound and the compound itself will be the same, but there may be other things that are carried along with it. And the question is, what are those things? What are the contaminants? What are the byproducts of that process? How critical are they in terms of hazards or other things? That, and that's something that's, I think, very difficult to understand, except for looking at it on a case by case basis, to be honest with you. Okay. Yeah. And in regard to some of those, uh, those other byproducts uh, that were discussed, I know the, uh, the different stereoisomers uh, that has come up uh, several times uh, also. And what I, you know, I was trying to Google, um, you, know, you guys are you know, probably familiar with uh, the, the pharmaceutical uh, grade uh, compound called uh, Jarbanol. Um, and you know, that is made, that's a truly synthetic uh, molecule, not made from a plant or anything. Um, and I believe it does have some of those same stereoisomers uh, that we've discussed uh, before in that. Uh, but I haven't run across any references that actually say how much of those stereoisomers are, are there are any effects because I know there's been, you know, uh, even though I think you know, there's probably some evidence out there showing that these uh, these other stereoisomers uh, are are not toxic. I haven't seen anything necessarily conclusive uh, yet of that. Um, uh, but you know, like I said, some of these uh, stereoisomers are produced in that pharmaceutical drug. Have you guys come across what those concentrations are, and uh, is that it, uh, is that would would it, whatever those limits are, those concentrations, would that be deemed an acceptable limit of those stereoisomers in these compounds? That's an interesting question, Rusty. And what I can tell you is that the United States Pharmacopeia monograph for dronabinol, right, the generic of Marinol, branded dronabinol, synthetic THC, is achiral. So you are permitted via the USP monograph to have both the minus trans and plus trans delta 9 THC in that product. Um, now, that's well, one of the methods by which dronabinol is produced is 
it sort of bakes in some of your stereochemistry. So it's, it's less, perhaps less of an issue, but via the monograph, you are permitted to have both of those stereoisomers. And if you look at the monograph, it's, it's instructive for other reasons, right? It, other than being a chiral and dealing with the stereoisomers we're discussing here, it also gives you limits or tolerances on other impurities. So for example, in dronabinol, you can have up to 1.5% CBN, you can have up to 2% delta-8 tetrahydrocannabinol, and up to a half a percent of exo-THC. Um, so th I think that's a very useful resource in our discussion here about what has been done with respect to, to dronabinol, which you have identified as THC produced via chemical synthesis. And I think another comment on that is that dronabinol in the form of marinol was approved by the FDA, the Food and Drug Administration, as a pharmaceutical drug. And in order for that to happen, it had to go through pretty significant safety and other evaluation trials, right? So it has been deemed by the FDA to be safe as, as long as it is being administered according to the prescription protocols that are supposed to be followed. So I don't know that we can question the FDA's conclusions about safety um, with with that regards. So but that's that's I think that's what we can say about it. Okay. So yeah, that's, I, I sort of I, mean, I, I definitely agree with you on, on that respect. So, but with that uh, being said, um, then is there uh, really a topic that needs to be discussed on these other stereoisomers if the FDA has already uh, said that they are uh, are not toxic or or if they're safe? Well, I don't know that it's actually said that they're not toxic or safe. I think it's or, said that dronabinol or dronabinol is, as a prescription drug, can be used in a manner that they would be, be would deem as safe as long as it's used in that manner. Now, if you then take the, that compound and put it into a, a, a you know many different, um, I don't know. I mean, you've got vaping. You've got it could be added to the edibles. There's lots of different ways that it could then be in, you know, put into the human body and then your dosage becomes completely unregulated. And then the question about safety becomes a completely different issue because it's no longer being monitored by a physician at specific doses. Okay, I, I guess that's sort of like, uh, you know, Delta 9 uh, THC. Uh, also, it's uh, it's definitely being used. I'm sure the FDA doesn't necessarily give approval for all the, all the current ways that it's, uh, it, it's, it's used now, uh, but uh, it is, uh, they do not seem to draw a concern uh, around the, uh, some of the other isomers though. So I, I was just wondering if they, if they do not draw a concern, should we also draw, you know, should we draw a concern around it? I can respond to that in two ways, Rusty. One is that they're only speaking of, in terms of achiral, the minus or plus trans isomers isn't speaking to cis at all. Um, and the other way I can speak to that, and this is a, a bit of a corollary to what David was saying, that in the process of getting a process approved to produce an active pharmaceutical ingredient, you are characterizing all of your individual impurities that are produced by that process. So in the process of synthesizing THC, the sponsor was required to test us trans THC by itself and understand some of the toxicology. And that was the responsibility of the sponsor that was bringing that product produced via that process to market. And I think that's a key point here. Yeah, yeah so it does sound like it has been studied then uh, from what you're saying, Brad. Again, at least the one isomer, so the plus trans delta 9 THC, but not necessarily the, the cis. Okay, but, so, it, but it's also guess, been it's also if it been assist, that might be okay then, from my understanding. We can't say that. Um, also, we, there, there's no data to say that. Also, it's important to recognize that that whole process for dram, for dramatol approval followed the dosage regime that was going to be used for the final pharmaceutical drug. Right? It isn't what you're going to be getting in some extract that you get in a vape shop or in some edible that you buy at some store or something like that, right? It's going to be different. So it's th those could easily be different and could fall outside the realm of the, of the levels that were tested in that process for FDA approval. So it's really hard to say at this point that something that could come on the market 
would fit within that range or not. I mean, is that reasonable to say, Brad? That certainly is. And I, I'll add one other component there is that when you are approving a drug or a substance for an indication, you are doing a risk benefit analysis. So sometimes something will be approved for a specific condition and the risks will be deemed acceptable. So that risk calculation can be different, whether it's a different disease or it's the difference between somebody using it to treat a medical condition versus somebody perhaps using it for just any old adult use. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, uh, hopefully we can uh, work to determine, uh, you know, what some of the uh, the compounds are in this and see, uh, hey, is that cyst even made uh, in doing some of the uh, the process steps? Thank you. Ruski, have you have you um, requested whether or not you can get any of that data from the FDA? I have not <laughs> made that request yet, so that's uh, that's on my 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 agenda. I think the panel would love to see any data that, that you potentially get. I don't want to speak for the whole panel, but my guess is they would. Yeah, I, we have actually uh, put sent an email in to request uh, that information, but have not heard anything yet. We'll, we'll definitely keep you guys informed when we find out. Yeah, I, I, one of the main things I was I was thinking of, hey, this it's not necessarily a new anything new or a new concern. Uh, it has been looked at uh, before though, and so let's uh, take a look at what the what the findings were, and uh, go from there. Let the science decide. I think it's it, a great it, starting it, point, Rusty. Yep, yeah, absolutely. It, you know, it, it is it is hard sometimes. You know, talking to the FDA, you know, they're definitely not going to say, oh yeah, smoke all the uh, uh, you know negative trans delta nine that you want. Um, so, you know, it's a, sort of a little tricky slope uh, that you trade on. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Rusty. Um, I'm going to try to move back here to the previous slide because I think we missed one. Nope, we stayed in line. Good. All right. I was worried that we skipped over a question. So next, uh, we'd like to open the mic for Blade uh, Bowden. Blade, you should be unmuted now. I see Blade is Hello? joining through uh, the phone, it looks like. Okay. Can you hear heard... me? There you are. <laughs> Go ahead. Hello. Yeah, go ahead, Blade. We can hear you. All right. Well. Uh, we'll just go ahead and, and uh, I'll read the questions when, uh, uh, out loud. Um, and then maybe when Blade's audio is working, uh, he can uh, follow up with additional questions or, or um, any anything he wants to add to sort of um, expand on the question. But anyway, several states are in the process of approving or have already created a regulatory framework for hemp derived THC. Um, without national legalization on the horizon, interstate commerce soon to be a reality. What, was, uh, what should Washington be doing to embrace this innovation and regulate it? So I don't know if that's necessarily a question for the panel. Uh, you're, you're welcome to answer it. I know LCB um, isn't going to comment on this at this time. To, in my opinion, this is more of a, a, a policy question at this point, but I'll turn it over to the panel if you have ideas or opinions on that. I agree um, that it's a policy question. Kathy, I don't know how other people feel. I agree. It's certainly a policy question and has certain components of policy. I think there is a science component to it or a safety component. 
And I think that deals just with potential innovation in general. And I think there's a danger when there's a new innovation or potential for innovation to, to clamp down on it on one side. And on the other side, there's a potential for underestimating the, the hazards. And I think there's a dynamic tension that is involved here for demonstrating the safety or ensuring the safety of a new process or a product produced by a new process. Um, so from a science and safety standpoint, that's all you're looking for. You're looking for a safe product that can be produced safely and is safe for consumers to use. Uh, and I think that involves multiple people, multiple stakeholders to do that successfully. Anyone else? Hi, can you guys hear me? Can you guys hear me now? Yes, we can hear you now. Wonderful. My apologies on the audio complication there. Um, yeah, to to uh, clarify a little bit, I, it was more um, on the safety and, and efficacy um, side of it, like Brad stated. Um, so I appreciate his uh, answer to that the best that he could. Um, if, if does anybody else have anything to add for question one? Okay. Um, I, okay. So my my next question is, uh, if if the argument uh, is being made that there are potential unknowns in hemp derived THC products, the same argument can also be made that there are potential unknowns within other more commonly known extractions to produce THC products. How does one effectively regulate one version of the same compound, delta nine THC, to a greater degree? than traditional extraction methods with a greater percentage of unknowns relative to total cannabinoids. And I guess it's, it's basically, um, you know, uh, it, it, it just seems like um, this, uh, the unknown and, and, and byproduct argument is being named with being made without acknowledging the fact that there are are also unknowns in traditional extraction methods. Oh, I think I agree with you 100% that we should acknowledge that there are lots of unknowns in ex in extracts that are derived from cannabis plants. Um, there's a lot of if you look at detailed analyses of those extracts, you can find uh, you know, on the you know, LC MS analysis, for example, see lots of little small peaks, little you know, small levels of compounds, and most of those we don't know what they are. That's true. Um, but an extraction and a chemical conversion are two different things. And I think we need to, in both cases, you're having an extraction from hemp or from recreational cannabis, for example. In both cases, you're extracting, and then one of them is run through a process that causes chemical conversions to happen, right? Where you're converting the CBD into THC. And we talked about the stereoisomers of THC that can be formed. What we haven't talked about is that what happens to all of those unknown compounds that are there when that chemical transformation occurs. So now you've got that compounding the whole system as well. It gets really complex really quick. Most of them are found at very low levels. Most of those compounds are probably not gonna be hazardous, probably not a concern. But the reality is we don't really know about most of what those are and what could happen to them and what their safety levels would be. We really don't know. There's a lot we don't know. I think it's really <laughs> important that we emphasize that. There's really a lot we don't know. That is true. Fair statement. Anyone else on the panel wish to respond to this question? I just further underline what David said that they're just they're different unknowns. The unknowns that are found in processed cannabis material are one set. Those potential unknowns in those in THC generated from hemp or from product of syntheses are another set of unknowns. We just don't know enough to know which are potentially more hazardous or not. And I think that's that's the question. And I think the comments that Nephi made earlier about potency are really important to consider here, right? We, if we don't know how potent these compounds are, it's hard to make that judgment. 
it may be that they're they have very low potency and therefore that because they're found at low levels the threshold for any kind of hazard or toxicity is such that they won't be a concern but it's also possible i don't know that it will be the case but it's possible that any one of those compounds or derivative compounds could have a higher potency in which case it could become a concern but we don't know that right now yeah, that's correct. If if, uh, if there's low traces, low amount of a compound that is very highly potent, then it actually might produce a bioactivity that we don't know yet. In an ideal world, both would result into exactly the same molecule, independent of the procedure. If we were able to analyze the product and the final products are 100% equal, then there's no concern. But because maybe uh, of the differences in either synthesis or extraction procedures, there might be some byproducts even at low level that might differ between the two routes of synthesis or extraction. Then it's true that there might be different unknowns coming from one versus the other. Every uh, one way to think about it in pharmacology is every compound is safe and every compound is toxic. The same compound at very low doses, very rarely, is going to be safe. But the, that compound at very high dose, very commonly, is going to be toxic. And what we need to understand is what is the window where somebody can actually use this compound safely and have a biological effect if there's a, if there's a biological effect. One of the things as well is the panel, is, as Nephi pointed out, we've been talking about what's hypothetically produced. I don't think any of them, us have actually seen what's really produced. And at some point, looking at analysis of, of different extracts may be a valuable component to figure out what's there. There may not be cis components. There may be cis components. We're talking about what we believe could be a risk in the product, but we don't actually know what are in the products that are being produced. That's right, that's right, Jessica. That was the chromatogram that David was referring to. As you analyze your compound, you inject it into your HPLCMS, for example. You have your peak that comes out. This is the compound that you know and you're looking for. And if your product is not 100% pure, there might be other peaks that are coming out. And now it depends on, again, as Brad was saying, resources. Do we have the resources to go and find out what this compound is, isolate it, and study its safety profile or bioactivity profile? It's a lot another, of work. It depends. Yeah, another thing to think about is, is that how uniform and consistent is the conversion process, right? So one company may come up with a process that's extremely reproducible in their hands. They always do it the same. They always get the same products. You put that into somebody else's hands, it may be slightly different. Or another company may come up with another process that's similar but not the same. And you could end up with different compound, different byproducts if it happened. The other thing is the source material. So different hemp varieties have very different chemical profiles. I know that from personal experience. Um, and so depending on what you're looking at what, what you has a, have as a starting material, you could end up with different unknowns that end up being generated. You just don't know, right? So none of this stuff is 100% consistent at this point. It's hard to know what we're gonna be seeing. Doesn't mean that, yeah, I'll leave it there for now. One of the, one of the things the FDA does, and I realize that we are not an FDA regulated system, but one of the things they do with biosimilars is essentially if you want a biosimilar, which is a biotherapeutic generic to be released, you have to prove that it's similar. And it's been a fairly good method for them is the manufacturer is, is required to prove that their material is similar within a certain profile. Right, and botanical drugs fit under that category, for example, and they're very difficult to get approved um, because it's very difficult to demonstrate that you're going to end up with the same exact biosimilar product at the end of the day when you have different starting materials. So you have to be able to demonstrate 
that your source is very, very consistent. There are very few botanical drugs on the market right now. I don't know, actually know of any, but there, there may be some that exist, but it's di they're difficult. They're, there's not very many. They're very difficult to get approved. Yeah, I think Ambidiolix is the only one I know. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's right. That's it. All right, Blake, any follow up questions before we move to the next? Uh, no, so uh, in, in summation, I guess it would it be safe to say that there, there are unknowns, whether it's, it's hemp derived THC or I guess you could say a traditional uh, THC extract. It, it just ultimately comes down to what those unknowns are and what their potential potencies or effects may be. Yes, I think that's a good summary and the unknowns can can vary depending on the procedure to extract or to synthesize. Agreed. Okay, great. Thank you. And that was a very good question, Blade, by the way. It was. Thank you. Thank you for your answers. Thanks for getting questions to us early, Blade. That's greatly appreciated. All right, so moving on to the next question, hopefully. All right, this was from Mark um, uh, Tegan, I believe. If, if Mark is with us, Audrey, can we unmute Mark? Mark is Mark. with us, but I'm not able to mute or unmute him. So, Mark, if you're on and there's another way you can connect, we can try and unmute you or feel free to place your comment in or follow up in the, the chat. Okay, why don't we go ahead and I'll read these out loud for folks who are on the phone. Um, let me see, I'm about to move something here. A lot of people get confused and do not understand the difference between hemp sourced THC and synthetic THC. Synthetic THC is the historical term that was originally meant to describe designer drugs that mimic cannabinoids, but that are not THC. This includes K2 and spice and other designer drugs. To avoid confusion, can the term hemp source be used when referencing the conversion of hemp or CBD to THC instead of synthetic THC? I think the panel spoke to this, but anything else you'd like to add? Well, one thing real quick, I think we, we use the term artificial. I know synthetic is used a lot of time. I think, I think we like the term artificial instead of synthetic because of the, as we described before for the, it's just clearer what it means. And I agree with Brad's comment about call, cause, calling it, what did you call it again, Brad? Uh, produced via synth, synthetic chemical means, synthesis, chemical synthesis yeah. means. Correct. It's less loaded with baggage, I'd say. Yeah. yeah. But, and I'll just reiterate the other point. We we did answer this this question already, but just it bears repeating that hemp source is ambiguous. As David mentioned, hemp source can be natural THC extracted from hemp, or THC and potential stereoisomers produced by the conversion of CBD. So we we aim for from a scientific standpoint precise chemical terminology speak to trans minus delta 9 thc or other very specific chemical names yeah the other is i think as jessica mentioned the other hemp source sounds more like a marketing kind of terminology the word, maybe to add the word designer drug is interesting because that really makes us think about artificial synthetic drugs things that have been designed in the lab and do not actually occur in nature that's another word to actually probably define 
And the reality uh -oh. is, is if, if the samples were getting pure enough, the molecule is what the molecule is. We're, we're just talking about this because they're complex mixtures, I guess, in my mind. And I wanted to say, I think in uh, some of the discussions around this topic at LCB, we've seen all these terms used and, and several more to describe, I think the same thing, um, that this is one of the challenges that we have moving forward with respect to creating a regulatory structure. And that is making sure we're using terms that are scientifically accurate um, and, and get away from the kind of multiplicity I'm seeing in in terminology and inaccurate terminology. I think that's what I'm kind of hearing the panel say. So anything else on question one before we move on? Okay. Um, second question, analytical laboratories, laboratories pardon me, um, always have a standard deviation in their measurements. From numerous conversations I have had, it seems that a typical cannabis laboratory will have a potency standard deviation of plus or minus 5%. Therefore, if a pure oil that was truly 100% cannabinoids was analyzed, then it would be reasonable to expect results that range from 95 to 105% total cannabinoids. If a hemp source THC was analyzed and the total cannabinoid concentration was also between 95 to 105% THC, then would this be considered an acceptable value to bring to market? If not, if not, then what would be an acceptable value? It's kind of a speculatory question, it seems like. Well, maybe I'll add one comment in in with the view of a pharmacologist uh, when we look at a dose response increasing concentration of a drug uh, it usually from no biological activity to full biological activity if it's if it's a simple response it goes over two orders of magnitude so if you have one milligram it doesn't do anything 10 milligrams you're about halfway and 100 milligram, you're at 100% of your response, so two orders of magnitude. So pharmacologists also have this standard error of 5% because 5% of difference between, um, you know, 10 milligram versus 11 milligram, it is not going to do much difference in terms of bioactivity. So in terms of pharmacologists, this standard error is, is somewhat acceptable. Any any other comment from the panel? Yeah, I'll, I'll comment on two parts of this question. One, it's true that all analytical measurements, all methods have standard deviation. Um, sometimes a plus minus standard deviation is acceptable, and that can come from many different areas, from people weighing out sample to the instrumentation and the method. Um, but I will say that if you have a C of A and it has over 100% anything that you should question where you're getting that C of A from. So that's my first comment. My second comment is it's a question of purity and impurities. So if you have 100% and again, being chemically precise, minus trans delta 9 THC, then that's equivalent to the naturally occurring THC, then great. But if there's 1% 5% of something else, it's important to know what that is. And if that's something else, the stereoisomer or whatever, you want to know whether that's going to have an impact on the safety or hazard of the material. So it's it goes a bit deeper than just quantifying the, the purity of your total THC analogs. Yeah, no, I agree with that. Uh, I was commenting on the standard or error of the actual active ingredient itself. But if it, the standard error includes 
5% of other ingredients, I agree with you. We really need to find out what they are. Absolutely, Nathy. Uh, I agree. All right, and I'm not going to read the third question. Anybody want to tackle that? I, I kind of want to get to the audience questions, attendee questions. I'll just say quickly what David had already said. There's a lot that we don't know um, from the food we eat on a daily basis to perhaps the cannabis products we consume. 95% known is pretty good when it comes to the universe of things we don't know and we put in our bodies. So is it important that we know what else is in there? Probably, um, but I think how important is the question? All right, Any, anyone else? Okay, so Audrey, I think we have a few questions that um, came in on the chat. I'll hand it over to you to um, read those questions out and call on the person who asked the question. Thanks, Kathy. Thanks. Yeah, I've collected the questions that were put in the chat box. And just a reminder, if you have a another question that I, I don't get to, make sure you're um, selecting to everyone in the chat so that we can all see your question. So the first question we got was from, and I'm just going in the order they were received, is from Kent again, but I think this was actually already answered with his previous question. So um, I will pass over that one and go to uh, the second question we received, which was from Crystal Oliver. Uh, what if customers care about the sustainability and what waste are generated by the various chemicals used in the process? So Crystal, I will unmute you and give you a chance to, to speak to that. You should be unmuted. Okay, yeah, and I was just speaking to the, to the fact that we, talked about it being immaterial if the residuals are removed from the product, but I do think there's a component of the sustainability of the chemicals that are utilized in these conversion processes and kind of wondered what your thoughts are on, I guess, the sustainability and the chemical waste that's generated in creating these synthetic cannabinoids. I can answer that. I think that's a great question, Crystal. And didn't mean to minimize the other impacts that some of these processes can have. And I think that consideration, if you're a consumer, you wanna know all the things that impact what you put in your body or the decisions you make. So from a science perspective, you're making judgments on what impact perhaps a particular product can have on your environment or your society. I think that's, valuable information for a consumer to know. And I just add, I, I think that's something that many people in our society are very concerned with. So I think this is something it does. It doesn't, I think, go directly to the questions of policy that we were uh, sorry, the scientific stuff questions we were talking about today with regards to um, the specific uh, definitions of what it, you know, what a cannabinoid is, et cetera. But I think you're right that a lot of people care about these things and somebody that's working in this industry should definitely think about this seriously. I think it has an important role to play. All right, any other responses? All right, thanks for your question, Crystal. Um, Audrey, can we move to the next? Yes, yeah, so the next question I saw um, in the chat was from Jeff Merriman, and I will just also ask again if this was the, I only found these three questions in there that were directed to the panel. So if I've missed yours, it could be that I wasn't able to see it because it wasn't directed to everyone in the chat. So please do place your uh, question again in the chat if I've missed it. I apologize for that. So this third question um, 
Jeff Merriman says, I have a safety question with the research from the Chernobyl disaster and the cannabis plant being able to uptake heavy metals. Also knowing about the Green Run Iodine 131 release from Hanford in 1949 with secret ongoing heavy metal releases happening until the 1960s. Could any of these processes that are being talked about today also bring in these toxic, bring in these toxic heavy metals into the products? Also, since we don't test for any of this stuff, could we be poisoning our consumers? So, Jeff, I will unmute you. You should be unmuted. Perfect. So, hopefully, um, there's some research there on my question from uh, FOIA requests that are out there on the interwebs. If, but. Um, I know a lot of those heavy metals were found all the way up to Wenatchee by the U.S. government and with what we know from the Chernobyl project of the cannabis plant being the only plant known to man right now that can pick up some of the heaviest metals known to man. Um, when we start stripping these things out, are we bringing along stuff that we should not be bringing with and because we're concentrating, could this be something that 20 years down the line, we find out we're killing people because we have a product that we've designed or created or made using a process and concentrated something that should have never been concentrated. I, I can um, try attempt to answer some of that and I'm definitely not a heavy metal expert, so I defer to uh, David or Brad for this one as well. But I think that that's one of the reasons that people have strongly advocated for both pesticide and heavy metal testing in the 502 supply chain. Uh, it's currently an opt-in honor system. And the reality is, is that there probably are a lot of products out there in the current regulated system that have both heavy metal or pesticide contamination within them. And so I would advocate that products do get tested. And I do know there are a couple of brands out there that routinely test their products, but a lot of uh, people just don't. And the reality is, is there's a cost equation for people testing. And since not everybody is required to test, uh, it, it makes it for everyone to test and run a sustainable business. I'll turn it over to Brad and David if there's anything else on that. Yeah, it's, it's an interesting question, Jeff, um, you know, because even hemp or cannabis that is tested for heavy metals isn't tested for something like iodine um, or some of these heavy isotopes. Uh, we, you could run into a situation since hemp or, or cannabis is a, a heavy metal remediator that you do find if these isotopes are present in the soil or the media that they're being grown in, you do find them in the, the natural products of those plants. Whereas you may not find them in something that's produced from say a purified starting material stream like CBD. So it's, it's kind of an interesting point, um, but I don't know how, how prevalent that contamination is, uh, but we may be blind to its presence in some of our manufactured cannabis and hemp products. Yeah, I don't know that I have much more to add than that. I, th I think those are all good comments. I think it's definitely something that is of concern and needs to be evaluated and looked at. The question is how to do that. Mm -hmm. As Jessica mentioned. All right. Thank you very much. I just brought it up since we have Hanford in our backyard and a lot of our products have been grown in fallout areas from Hanford. Thanks very much for that question, Jeff. Uh, Audrey, any other questions? I think I just saw uh, another question come up. Am I right about that? Yes, we got a couple more questions, Kathy. So the next one I received was from Gregory Foster. Um, and Greg, I'll just unmute you and let you ask your question rather than than reading it. So you should be unmuted. Sure. And Thank you to all the panelists today for um, the, the excellent insights that you're offering. We really appreciate um, the, the guidance that you're offering everyone. 
Um, my question is pretty succinct. Um, it follows up on the, the first deliberative dialogue. Just wanted to confirm my understanding that cannabis plants produce molecules of one chirality. And so synthesize molecules of a different chirality would technically be artificial cannabinoids. I think that's safe to say. Um, I've, I've looked into there's some old literature that suggests that maybe like the, the other versions exist. This was all published back in the 1970s, and the, I went and read some of those papers, and the data is really not there to support the conclusions. So the data that we have right now that I think we can rely on suggests that yes, it's the minus trans delta nine THC that exists. The others are really not present now. Is if if the material was collected and processed in a way um, that could lead to conversion into those other compounds, then that could, it definitely could be there in a product derived from it. But I think it's probably safe to say that you know the acid forms of these compounds at the, with that stereochemistry, is, there's no evidence that any that the other forms are there. Not that I was able to find yet, anyway. Unless somebody else on the panel found a paper I haven't found. And maybe just to, uh, this is also from my own knowledge. If I remember well, there's only one enantiomer, one stereoisomer that has been, that is produced by the plant because it's an enzymatic pathway that produces this molecule and enzymes typically are stereoselective. That's why the plant does only this one enantiomer. Whereas in a lab, when you do your synthetic your chemical synthesis, you can actually have much more diversity in the enantiomeres and it's not as stereoselective. Is that a good way to think about it? Yeah, I think so. Okay. I think mean, that's a good way to describe it. Now, and, you know, there are ex other examples where you've got classes of compounds where one plant makes the left handed version, another plant that's makes right. the right handed version, and a third plant makes. Both of those, I happened to work on a group of compounds when I was a grad student. And that's exactly what we did. We looked at, we were looking at this question in a totally different class of compounds. It's very fascinating stuff, but it was different enzymes. Each enzyme was pretty specific to what it did. Some were very specific. And then you've also got some enzymes that are racemic. They just make a mixture of everything, right? Mm -hmm. But we don't have any evidence that in, in the case of the cannabinoids that that's the case. Cannabis sativa you know, evolved, something happened in its evolution and develop this new synthase that leads to production of these compounds that exists only in this plant and it's pretty specific to what it does. Thank you. Thank you. All right, thanks for the question, um, Greg. Uh, Audrey, next question. So we're on to our final question. So again, if you have others, feel free to put them in the chat. The last one I got is from Jim McRae and I will unmute you, Jim. So you are unmuted. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Oh, wonderful, thank you. I'm not on my microphone, I hope it's okay. Um, this question, it's, it's, it's the discussion of cannab cannabinoids and the potential inversion into the market and the potential chemical conversion of the the CBD coming in from hemp to THC that got me thinking about this a little bit. And it's, it's a question that I think falls outside of the potential realm of 502 5052 regulation. However, it's pertinent to the industry and I think pertinent to some of the issues of competition that have been raised. And the question is this if a CBD edible, the, the type that are available in, in coffee shops now in the state, gas stations, convenience stores, not the regulated stores, the, the, the stuff that's kind of non-regulated. If one of those were to contain, you know, inadvertent THC, but, but still at a level less than 0.3%, and I thought in my question was 0.2999% uh, THC by weight, would that be considered still a hemp based product? And therefore, is it something that falls outside of the regulation of the LCB and I guess to an extent, the DOH aside from just the manufacture of commercial foodstuffs? That's, that's my question. Is that outside of this regulatory scope? Am I right on that?
Jess, did you want to answer that? Oh, Brad, go ahead. Uh, yeah, yeah. Or Brad, I was going to say, Jim, honestly, I don't know. Um, I'm not as familiar with the regulations around weight volume and hemp products and the definition of that. I don't know, Brad, if you have any additional information on that, but I'm not um, up to date on the regulations around that. Thank you, Thank you, Dr. Tanani. Yeah, just to, to clarify, the reason I brought this up was because of the discussion that the normal concentrated juice, if you will, is in itself not 100% pure. It's going to have a little, somebody said there's a little bit of CBN, there's a little bit of CBG, all that sort of stuff. So it struck me as natural that if somebody were making a CBD infused edible, having non-zero amounts of other minor cannabinoids in that product would be normal and expected. And then hence, I wondered if that 0.3% threshold that seems to define at least at the plant level, the distinction, the legal distinction between cannabis and hemp, applies to that hemp based product definition that was put into Washington law in 2018. So that, that I appreciate that Jessica. Thank you. I can add a little bit of perhaps history there. Um, the 0.3% THC limit was meant to discriminate between THC containing cannabis, marijuana and hemp. But it was meant to be just for the plant material itself. It was never, I believe, intended for manufactured cannabis products. Because as you sort of identified here, Jim, you can have a situation where you have a 100 milligram brownie, or sorry, a 100 gram brownie that has 0.3 grams of THC. That's 300 milligrams of THC. And by this definition of weight percent would be considered a, a hemp product, right? I don't think that yep. was ever intended. And I can say that from a science standpoint that there's other regulatory groups that are grappling with this now. Uh, I think the best way you could define a manufactured hemp product is not only by weight percent, but by absolute concentration of the substance you want to limit. So if it's THC, not just by that weight percent, but say a certain number of milligrams, no matter how big the unit mass of that finished product is. Thank you. All right. That was a great question. I yeah. learned a lot. Yeah, thanks for the question, Jim. Any other feedback from panelists? David, do you want to say anything else? Well, the, the definition of hemp is it's, a, it's on a dry weight basis, right? Yeah. And so it's going to depend on. But that's a really good question of what the original source is. My understanding, I have to go back and read the law again. I've done, I've read it many times, but I have, I have to remind myself all the time about this because the language, you got to think about it different when you have a different question. Um, I, I think the whole point of the, you know, it's all based on the 2018 farm bill and then our state put into, you know, it's, it's codes, the, how we're going to deal with that and how we're going to manage within that framework. And our state department of ag is, you know, oversees that. And I'm pretty sure, as Brad said, the intent there is, is it's hemp derived products are really what fits within hemp. So if you get something from the field, that's hemp and it maintains those levels below 0.3%, you can still call it hemp. If you start out. I think this, I think, I think this may be true, but we probably want to have somebody verify that. But if you start out with non hemp cannabis, so high THC cannabis, you're already in the illicit market, according to the federal rules, and you can't get out of that. So, if you're using THC derived from um, recreational cannabis and putting that in and then putting it at this level, it's still considered as far as the DEA is concerned. It still should be considered non hemp. It should be considered. What they call marijuana. Pretty sure that's how it works. Not 100% sure, but I'm pretty sure that's how it works. But yeah, does that make sense? I don't know. It's it yeah, yeah. the way the regulations it, work, right? It, it did. It did actually, David. Thank you. And I appreciate your answer and your work, by the way. Um, the flipping it on the other side, and this, if you don't mind, because I'm getting to a point here that I think 
goes to how much of a competitive threat this potentially is to the industry. Because a lot of folks have been concerned about what it'll do to the biomass producers and stuff like that. But under my understanding to flip back into the 502 system now, my understanding is that under the current rules, someone could bring in hemp based flour, hemp based CBD oil, could do a chemical conversion, arguably, of the CBD to something that contains a significant amount of THC, but a non zero amount of CBD in the remaining goop. That goop then could be sprayed on the CBD flour, CBD hemp flour to enhance the CBD of it because there's non zero CBD. But in the meanwhile, they've converted it over to 53% THC. So now you have a completely hemp based product plus a little bit within 502 where some CBD hemp oil has been converted partially to THC. That's sprayed back on or infused back onto the flour. And suddenly you have a something that hasn't touched a single grower or, or there's no Washington regulated cannabis product in that thing that's now flying off the shelves. That's an infused joint. It's all bas basically hemp, but has a sufficient amount of THC in it because the CBD with which you are now juicing the flour happens to have been converted. And I don't know what the conversion percentages are, the efficiency, but I've seen numbers as high as 53%. If you have a liter of CBD, you can make 530, uh, you know, 0.53 of that uh, of THC. I suspect it can be higher, but that's at least a, the biggest that I've seen in, in writing. Um, if you do that, that original intent of 2334, the legislation that's enabled this to come in, where you can only use it to juice the CBD or to increase the CBD. If a carrying agent now is THC within that now diluted CBD stuff, you're still juicing the CBD. You're, you're increasing the CBD. You just happen to be putting a lot of THC in it as well. So just you know, thinking about that, basically everything in the market is potentially at risk if you were trying to grow it as a regulated cannabis producer right now. Just a thought. Yeah, that, that raises an interesting question because if you think about hemp definition of hemp, um, at the federal level and what's pretty much mimicked in our state law is that as long as you stay below 0.3% THC, you can call it hemp. As soon as you get above it, it's no longer hemp. It then becomes the federally illicit substance, right? The controlled substance. And so now it's not a hemp product anymore at all. And somebody who is handling it is now working within the legal framework of the state, separate from the federal framework. And this is something that we deal with, you know, at the, at the university because we're not allowed to deal with anything that's non hemp because of issues with regards to, you know, the whole illicit substance act and stuff like that. But anyway, yeah, this is a really interesting question because I got to think about this. I, I think one of the things that I believe the law states is that synthesis of Delta 9 is illegal outside of the 502 system. I, I, yeah, I think you're right. Yeah. And so I think that the only caveat in that scenario, Jim, is that if you are intentionally synthesizing Delta 9 outside of the 502 system, it is not legal, is my understanding, but I don't know that for fact. That was my understanding too, but again, I'm not 100% sure. But somebody that's within the 502 system and has a license to work with it, could they then proceed and, and generate products? Because they have a license to be a, uh, a high THC producer. I think they would have to, it would have to be somebody that's got a license to do that within that framework. Possibly I, I was not in that in the instance of the coffee shop brownie. The non regulated 1, I was not really thinking about people synthesizing THC Jessica. I was thinking about 200,000 hectares of hemp at 3% right. spewing out a lot of THC in and of itself that's available. 
Yeah, but as soon as you as soon as you separate the THC and concentrate it, so it's no longer 0.3 percent of whatever oh. you're handling, it's no longer hemp. If it's once it goes above that level, so as um, long as you keep it at your 0.29999 percent, the problem is you're not going to get a brownie like that because in order to get the brownie at that level, you're going to have to have an extract that's much higher than that to put into the brownie, right? Well, you could call it an extract if you want. I could call it um, a homogenization interim. Pro you know, I, I think someone could put together a process flow. You can't escape the fact that you have to bring it at above 0.3%. I agree with you that on logically, but I think you could do something. Let's put it this way. You're pushing into a gray area uh -huh. that if the state allows this to happen within the regulated market, you're kind of almost setting a standard by which who's to stop me from going down and buying a 12 ounce can of soda that has 106 standard doses of 10 milligram THC in it, um, which is, by the way, about what the amount would be if you were at 0.3% on a 12 ounce can of soda. Um, and it, you know, it, it's, it's obviously it doesn't feel right, but it doesn't feel right, frankly, as a consumer that I've got this market out here where there's a bunch of people that have been looked at very closely for years and their quality assurance, cameras, everything. And suddenly I can't go to the, I can't go to a store and buy something and not know it wasn't grown over a, the Chernobyl site, or a, I, my preference is to say a uh, landfill in outside lower Pakistan and subsequently concentrated, brought into Washington and done with whatever. So, as just from a consumer perspective, I know if it's done right, even in, in that situation and that bad image, it can be done safely. Who's to say it's being done right? Thank you. Honestly, Jim, I think there are two different issues here. I think one you recognize is the definition in the farm bill of what hemp derived means and whether you can have in process hemp materials that are above 0.3% THC. Yep. And can those make it into hemp based products that are sold in coffee shops or convenience stores and that potentially have large quantities of THC in them? I think that's one question. I think that will be resolved at some point by FDA. They're likely to be the regulatory agency on the federal level that resolves that. And you have some state based regulators like New York State that have started to advocate for definitions of in-process hemp material that can have higher quantities of, of THC. But I think the other question here is what we can address in the, the state regulated markets. And I 100% I agree that these illicit markets represent a threat to the tested regulated marketplaces. But I think that our questions with respect to this discussion of where THC comes from are, are different in terms, in terms of, of the quantities you can find in our, the products in the regulated market and those that you can find outside of it. And I think there, there's different precedents there. Thank you. Thanks very much for your question, Jim. Um, Audrey, I think that was our last question. Am I correct? Correct. Okay, thank you. So, with with two minutes to go, um, uh, first of all, I just want to thank our panelists again, Brad, David, Nephi, uh, Jessica, for coming back a second time and um, helping us wrap up this discussion um, around uh, evaluation of THC products. We really, really appreciate the the gift of your time. Justin was not able to join us today, but I know he joins me with the rest of the agency and, and thanking you very much for the for that time that you've shared with us. Um, next steps for us in terms of rule development. Um, as uh, I shared at the beginning of the discussion today and in caucus today, um, we did uh, expand the scope of our CR 101 for this work, and I do expect to have draft conceptual rules done by mid to late August. And that is around the evaluation of THC compounds. Um, we will schedule a listen and learn 
likely late August, early September on those perhaps conceptual rules so that we can keep moving forward with our timeline uh, of rural development. So that would have us at a CR room to uh, towards the end of September and public hearing in November. So those are next steps for us at this point at LCD. Um, if anyone uh, who's joined us today has any additional follow up questions they'd like to provide to us, we're happy to send them on to panelists if that's okay with you. Um, uh, to kind of keep the conversation going, uh, we're, we're happy to facilitate that and hope that panelists have uh, time and capacity to do that. Just want to offer that at this point. Is that okay? Okay, great. Thanks very much. So with that, we have hit four o'clock. Um, again, if uh, you have any other questions, you can email me directly or email our rules inbox that was provided uh, with the messaging that was offered today. Thanks very much for your participation. And we look forward to working with all of you um, on this very important work in the future. That concludes our session for today. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thanks. Audrey. Kathy, I think there's still some attendees on right now, but I will stop the recording and save the chat. Okay, very good. I was just going to ask. Um, yeah, we can stop and I think I will save the chat too, just in case.